Amen. You guys could take a seat. I was uh, overcome with a lot of emotion as I was sitting over there. <clears throat> and I felt the weight of someone, or many someones, or maybe myself, that see those words and say, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see that God's good. I don't feel his faithfulness in my life. And I pray that today something would change for you. That when we lay our life down and give him everything, like the lyrics say, his goodness, he will chase after you like a good father. So I pray for those of you that came in here carrying something heavy. Maybe you're just waiting on something. Maybe you're waiting on the answered prayer. Maybe you're waiting on the person. I pray today that not that the doors would fling wide. Sometimes God just opens a crack. And you need to have the faith to know that even when we can't see it, he really is working. He really is. And you might not understand it now, but I promise you that one day, whether it's a week or a year or 10 years, you'll be able to look back over the course of your life and see, I felt like God was distant, but he was doing so much I just couldn't see it. So if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that we've been in the midst of this series titled Living Big. And we discussed that in order to live big lives, we need to first invite Jesus into them. If we want to live big lives, we need to take risks. If we want to live big lives, we need to serve others and serve the church. And today is part four of Living Big. We're going to be reading two pieces of scripture today, starting with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. It says this, Dear, dear Christians... I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live open and expansively. How many people want to live an open and expansive life? Our second verse we're going to be reading from is Matthew chapter 11, starting with verse 2, and it says this. But for context, John the Baptist is in prison here, and Herod, who was the king at the time, his wife, as a birthday gift, wanted John the Baptist to be beheaded, literally. So Herod, being a good husband, no, I'm just kidding. So, so Herod puts first John, he puts him in prison and says this. He says, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, they're talking to Jesus here, saying, are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you see and hear. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And hear this. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for today. I pray that that worship was pleasing to you, Lord God. I pray that that worship would have stirred in the hearts of many here this morning, that we would really, really encounter you, God, because without you, this is just a Christian country club, Lord, and that is not what we're in the business of, Lord God. We're in the business of changing lives because of who you are, Lord. So I pray that you would work in the midst of this service, God. I pray that those that are feeling distant from you, that they would know that while they're maybe running from you, you've never abandoned them. You've never left their side. And I pray today they would, just, they would just be able to be a little more attentive to who you are and where you are. Thank you for never leaving us, despite the fact that we run from you, despite the fact that we get offended by you. And I pray today, like verse 6 says, that, that we would be blessed and that we wouldn't be offended by who you are. Lord, we love you. Would you move me out of the way now and just... And just speak through your word here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's have church. So Halloween is coming up, and I hate it. And uh, it's this entire day that's basically based around fear. I do not like being scared, so I do not like Halloween. It's not like I'm some holy roller who's like, no Halloween. I just don't like being scared. So with that in mind, I looked up some of the funniest phobias some of the funniest things that people are scared of. They're going to be coming up on the screen. Josh, bring up the first one. The first one, papaphobia. Fear of the Pope. Next one. I'm going to screw up all these names, by the way. Xanthopia. Fear of the color yellow. Next one. Genophobia. Fear of knees. Anatidaphobia. Fear of being watched. Not ducks. Fear of being watched by a duck. 
Jellyophobia, fear of laughter. I'm sorry if you have this one because we're doing a lot of laughing in church. Look at this one. Hippopotamonstrosis quips aliophobia, the fear of long words. Next one. Ponog- Poganophobia. If you have this one, you're not going to do good in this church. The fear of beards. I ain't shaving, so find a new church. Those are some funny ones, but here's some serious ones. How many of you have arachnophobia? How many people are scared of spiders? A few people. Next one. Ophidiophobia, <laughs> fear of snakes. Anyone scared of snakes? Couple? <laughs> Colorophobia, fear of clowns. Anybody or just kids? Did we outgrow that ever? I don't know. Tyrannophobia, fear of needles. Who's scared of needles? Some of you are like, why did I come to church today? Next, acrophobia, fear of heights. Anybody scared of heights? I'm scared of heights. What else? Claustrophobia, fear of confined spaces. Anybody? <laughs> Excuse me. Not just me. Uh, I am totally, totally claustrophobic. If you don't know, I work in commercial construction by day and pastor by Saturday day. Um, and, and this is one, uh, this was one time that I was working in a hotel in Manhattan. And all these construction workers, we have to wait to get in this one elevator that takes us up to whatever floor that we have to go to. Well, this day, the elevator was packed full. And I'm already on edge because I'm feeling claustrophobic by the amount of people that are in this elevator. And then suddenly, the elevator comes to an abrupt stop. And I thought for sure that I was on the Tower of Terror. <laughs> so the operator hits the open door button and the doors open and it's just bricks. We're in between two floors and there's no way to get out. And I just feel heat come over my whole body. Like I'm about to pass out. And thankfully, we were only stuck for about five ni- minutes, but I do not like tight, confined spaces. And I think for many of us, we can find ourselves experiencing spiritual claustrophobia. We feel trapped. We feel out of control. We feel fenced in. Which brings us back to this verse in Corinthians where Paul says, who fenced you in? Who fenced you in? So I want us to imagine this idea of being closed in, fenced in. And and hopping forward into Matthew 11, we read about John the Baptist. Right? John is the preacher before Jesus. He's the one baptizing people. He's the one who baptized Jesus. So he's leading people to repent for their sins. And he's kind of a big deal. And the king at the time, Herod, his wife hated John. So she says, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter for my birthday. So the king, Herod, first puts John in prison. That's where we pick up. John's in prison waiting to be beheaded. And he calls for his disciples and he says, hey, I need you to go and find Jesus. And I need you to ask him if he's who I think he is. If he's the one or if I should wait for another. Ask Jesus if he really is the guy who he says he is. This would be like me spending my entire life preaching and leading this church. And then showing up one Saturday and being like, guys, I'm not sure if Jesus is who he says he is after all. That's what's happening here. John is in prison, about to die, and he says, go and ask if he's truly the one I've been preaching about. And Jesus responds, and we'll get to that, but for a moment, let's just jump ahead. I want you to listen to the line at the end of what Jesus says here. He goes, blessed is the one who doesn't get offended by me. Blessed is the one who doesn't get offended by me. What does it mean to be a big person? How do I live a big life? Again, not a big wallet and a big home, but a big life. The people who live big lives aren't easily offended. This is why people can go through the same thing, the same scenario, but come out of it with two different outcomes. Two people can go through a divorce or a business shutting down or experience the same kind of hardship and pain, but they are not the same people. You know what I'm talking about? You guys with me so far? Maybe you've met someone who has this softness about them. Just being around those types of people make you feel refreshed. And that's what I hope our church has been to many of you and will continue to be a place of refreshment. But you know these people that are so full of joy, and then you hear their story and what they went through in this life, and you realize that that what they've been through doesn't match their attitude. You're like, how are you this way? How do you act, talk, and live this way after what you've been through? Because big people are not easily offended. And this is countercultural because we live in a world where everybody is offended by everything. Right? We're offended by everything and everyone. And it's actually incredibly sad because for many of us, we have simply forgotten how to have a conversation. You no longer can go back and forth respectfully with somebody in dialogue. Now every disagreement means division. Every disagreement means disunity. So Jesus says to tell John, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. 
And hear me, it's one thing to be offended by people. It's another thing to be offended by God. So today we're going to talk about what it means to be disappointed, to be offended by God. Because John is living a life that he thought would go very different. He preached his whole life about Jesus. He baptized Jesus. John is a superstar in the Bible. But now he's sitting in prison about to be beheaded. Like, Jesus, uh, this is not how I expected things to turn out. Are you sure you are who you say you are? And maybe you felt this way before, too. That your circumstances left you saying, really, God? Really? But Jesus says the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the sick are healed. But I hope you don't get offended by me. We could probably all identify a time when a person offended us. But when was the last time that we sat down and really thought about if we were offended by God. It's probably not something that we do or consider often. But here's the thing. God can offend us. God can do some things that we don't like. God cannot do some things that we want him to. And one of the best ways that you can live a big life is by being tender-hearted with God, by being soft-hearted with God. Because there are some things that we experience in this life that will make us be offended by him. Our lives don't know this, can get really hard sometimes, right? And maybe, maybe you wouldn't use the word offended, but consider this morning, are you disappointed by God? Are you disappointed by God? Have you ever felt boxed in or fenced in in this life, down and out, and wondered, where is God? What is he doing? And maybe you felt disappointed or offended. So I wonder how many in the room have been disappointed by God Maybe you didn't get that answered prayer that you were hoping for. Maybe the spouse still hasn't shown up yet. Maybe the pregnancy hasn't happened yet. Maybe the job hasn't come. Maybe the family member died and and the prayers that we're praying aren't matching up with the life that we're living. And the life we thought was going to happen just hasn't happened yet. And it's possible for us to be in our prison cell and look out at all Jesus is doing in other people's lives and get offended. And if you've ever felt this way, welcome to the club. Because whether we want to admit it or not, we've all experienced this. Maybe we just haven't realized it yet. And here's what I need you to consider this morning. If you live an offended life, you will live a fenced-in one. And I wonder if we're living small lives because we choose to live in offense daily. We could find ourselves getting offended by people over things that we're actually just deeply offended by God about. But it's easier to blame them because we could see them. But in reality, I think that we're actually offended by God. So I wonder if in some of our lives you think you're just offended, like it's just a feeling or an emotion, but it's actually causing you to box and fence yourself in. I'm going to get something that I went to Home Depot today at 6 a.m. to get, and I ha- haven't even tried it out to see if this illustration is going to work. So if it flops, don't tell me. I wonder how many of us live small lives every weekend because we build up the walls and the fence of offense. And the more you feel isolated, the more you feel like your leaders don't love you, the more you feel like you're not being thanked enough, look at that, the more you feel like what you're doing doesn't matter and nobody cares about you, and what you think you're doing is you think that you're hurting others, but in reality, you're hurting yourself. And some of you are picking up every small offense and building a fence. And there's a difference between someone hurting you and you being offended because a fence has to be picked up and planted. So some of you have spent the last two weeks, two months, two years, or two decades building our fence of offense. And then you wonder why you feel small and isolated. You wonder why it's always them and not you. But when you build your fence, your perception changes because you're just peeking through the hole of that fence. You're just peeking through the hole of your fence that you've built by yourself, around yourself, because of the times you've been offended. And I wonder if the fence that you've built is subconsciously because you're offended by Jesus. Now, what's interesting about building a fence is that when you're on one side of it, you try to peek out, but you can't see the images clearly, right? Have you, if maybe you've done this as a kid. I hope you haven't done it as an adult because that's kind of weird. But maybe you've tried to look through your neighbor's fence, and you could kind of see what they're doing. Kind of looks like fun. Are they playing basketball? But you you can't see it clearly. 
And this is what happens when we peek through our fence of offense. Uh, of course they got invited and I didn't. Of course they got new shoes and, and I didn't. Of course they became a leader and I didn't. Of course they said that. Of course they posted that. And we make an entire assumption about others based on the blurred perspective through the hole we have in our offense fence. Second Corinthians, again, it says, who fenced you in? The smallness you feel doesn't come from us. It comes from you. Ouch. Again, many of us find ourselves in this, in this box, in this fence that we've built around ourselves, and it's because you pick up every offense and you build a fence. And it's the reason you feel isolated, you feel distant, and if you're not careful, you could spend your entire church existing watching everybody through the peephole of your fence. So here's two questions that I want you to consider this morning. Number one is this. Have you let questions turn into offense? Have you let questions turn into offense? John asked Jesus, where are you? Notice that John is questioning Jesus on who he is, and Jesus tells his disciples to go back and tell John who he is. And what's amazing is that while we're second-guessing God, guess what? He never second-guesses us. He never second-guesses us. God is not scared of our questions, okay? Like, God, where are you? How did you let this happen? God is not scared of your questions. What he is concerned is making sure that your deep questions don't turn into deep offense. Because here's what I think we subconsciously do. We spend our prayer time with God sitting on the throne instead of kneeling before it. We spend our prayer time with God sitting on the throne like, God, here's what I need you to do if you could go and do it. Instead of kneeling before the throne and saying, God, I, I need you. I am nothing without you. And if we spend our prayer time on the throne, that is the first step towards being offended by God when he doesn't do what we expect him to do. If you didn't know this, I used to be the lead singer in a worship band. No big deal. Uh, <laughs> no, our music's still on YouTube if you're interested. But, but Caitlin even allowed me to build a recording studio in the basement of our house. And because of that, I spent a lot of time at music stores buying equipment and instruments and stuff like that. And without fail, every time that I would be in there, there would be some kid trying to like cover John Mayer or something. And it was always awful. It was always terrible. Now, I wonder how silly it would be if I heard that kid playing that terrible cover, and I was like, you know what? I am never listening to John Mayer again. That was terrible. It'd be ridiculous, because if I listen to John Mayer, if I listen to the source itself, I'd realize that it's a lot better than that cover. And I think, for some of us who've been in church before, we've been hurt by other Christians. Some of them might have even been pastors. And we're that silly person who says, I'm never going to church again. I'm never praying. I'm never believing in God. Guys, us Christians are imperfect and sinful people trying to convey the message of a perfect and flawless God. Of course we're going to screw it up. And I'll be honest with you guys. The deepest hurt that I've ever experienced in my life has come from churches. The most offense I've ever experienced is from people who were Christians. People that I served alongside. The most hurtful conversations I've had have been with other pastors. But in spite of all of that, I still wanted to plant a church. I still wanted to be part of a thing that cut me the deepest. Because often, God in his goodness and wisdom will use the thing that caused the most pain to also cause the healing. That's why Psalm 30 says this. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may come through the night, but joy comes in the morning. For some of you who are in a painful season right now, hold on, because joy is coming. Our second question here for you this morning is this. Is God still a promise keeper, even if I'm not experiencing the promise is God still a promise keeper, even if I'm not experiencing the promise? John was preaching that a man was to come and save, to heal and do miraculous things. John was preaching everything Jesus was going to do. And Jesus' response to John is, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do, even if you're not experiencing it. And Jesus is saying, John, I'm still faithful to my word, even though you're not experiencing it. Is that okay with you? And we are the same exact way. 
Our offense towards Jesus comes when he does things for other people and not us. When they get the raise and I don't. When they get pregnant and I don't. When they get asked to become a leader and I don't. When they get the marriage and I don't. Jesus, you said you were going to do these things. And he's saying, I am doing it. So when Jesus isn't doing what you're asking him, it doesn't change his character. It doesn't change his character. I understand that these are tough things to consider. Is he still a promise keeper like we sang about? Is he still a promise keeper if you aren't experiencing the promise? So you don't get healed. But he healed people all over this world. Just that. So he still is a healer. So we need to consider this morning, what are we more concerned about? His character or our own experience? Because often, the offense to God comes from his experience with you. Again, Jesus' response to John is, I'm doing what I said I was going to do, but I'm not coming to get you out of jail. Because I hope you're not offended by me. Blessed is the one who's not offended by me. He doesn't say, don't be offended by Herod who put you in jail. He doesn't say, don't be offended by Herod's wife who wanted you dead. He says, don't be offended by me. So I wonder how many of us have been living our entire lives behind this fence because of every offense we picked up, and now we're the Christians judging everyone else. Some of us need to consider maybe the person you're mad at isn't the real person you're mad at. Maybe it's Jesus you're mad at, and you're just taking it out on them. Again, I know this is tough to consider, but hear me today. It's okay to admit that you're disappointed by God. He can handle it. I thought things would be different. I thought my life would look different. And now because of your offense, you've built a fence. And you've caused yourself further pain because now not only are you offended, but now you're separated and you're isolated because of your offense fence. So today I want to encourage you guys to start taking down the fence in your life. And say, Jesus... Here's what happened to me in the second grade. Here's that first coach who made me feel bad about myself. Here's that parent who never supported me. Jesus, here's my ex who manipulated me so bad that I don't even know what love is anymore. Here's myself. I've let myself down a lot. Here's that pastor that made me hate church. Here's that church leader who gossiped about me. Here's that friend who, who always made me feel lesser than them. Fill in the blank for you. And the biggest offense that we need to let go of is saying, God, I'm sorry for being disappointed in you. Maybe today you're realizing for the first time that you've been carrying an offense toward God. And I think for many of us, our horizontal relationships will get way better if we fix the vertical one. Because when our relationship with God is right, we suddenly realize that some of the things in this life aren't really that big of a deal anymore. I promise you that whatever you're going through today will get better if your relationship with God gets better. So you feel fenced in. You feel spiritually claustrophobic. I wonder if it's because you spent too much time living behind the fence of a fence. This song that we're going to sing, many of you may know, how he loves. And it was written by a very popular writer, John Mark McMillan. And John Mark tells this story one night at a youth conference. His friend was praying and his friend said, I would give my life for these people that I love. And that very night, his friend died in a terrible accident. McMillan says, I was in complete shock of my friend dying and I sat down and had a conversation with God about it. I was super angry and I didn't know who to be angry at. And I came to realize that if you're angry at nobody, then you're really angry at God. Because he's the only one who could change anything anyway. So I sat down. And I didn't have a bad attitude, he says. I wasn't shaking my fist at God. I was just, I guess, hurt. And so I sat down and that song just sort of materialized. And as I was singing the song in my heart, I was questioning the love of God. I was trying to have a conversation with God, but I think he was speaking to me in the song, even though I was the one writing it. And the reality is that even in the midst of pain, God still loves us. I'm not sure who needed to hear this today, but even in the midst of your pain that you might be going through right now, God loves you. 
If you're angry with God today, God loves you. Or maybe you're here today and you're not in a dark season. I hope this is just a simple reminder that God loves you. Maybe you're here today and you never knew and never heard that God loves you. Good news, he does. And that's the most amazing thing about God, is that without the guarantee of him loving us, he first, of us loving him, I'm sorry, he first loved us. Let's pray. God, I pray today that for those of us that have built up this fence of offense, that you would just help us start taking it out piece by piece, plank by plank, Lord. All the things that we've held on to, some conscious and some subconscious, God. Would you help us let go today? Thank you that you're, you're a good God that wants to take the weight of these things from us. Lord, so I pray today that whatever that is, whatever pieces of fence we've planted in our ground, that you would help us let go today and throw it aside and say, God, I want to live openly and expansively. You didn't fence us in, Lord. We did that to ourselves. I pray that you would help us live that open, expansive life because you have so much more for us. And that's not prosperity gospel, that's a mission. You've got so much for us to do, Lord. Everyone here who calls this church home, who calls themselves a follower, has a call on their life to go into the world and to spread the gospel and to baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I can't reach their neighbors, God. They have to do that. I can't reach their coworkers, Lord. They have to do that. So I pray today as we take out the fence of offense, Lord, that we would be able to run. I see an open field, Lord, that we would be able to run and share of your goodness. Lord, and that this church would grow, not to say we have a big church, but that we have a lot of people living big lives. A lot of people who prior to this didn't know their Savior, but now they know. And their lives are forever changed. And things that were once a big deal, things that were once offensive, aren't any longer. Praise Jesus. God, I pray that as we get ready to sing, you would remind us of your love. I pray today that those that are seeing these words on the screen and hearing these words saying that don't know your love, God, I pray that like the good father you are, you would just wrap your arms around them and let them feel the love and the embrace of a father today. That's why we're here. Lord, we love you. Thank you for giving us a reason to sing and celebrate and preach and yell sometimes. Uh, God, uh, thank you. Keep this church on mission, Lord. Would you know that when you look over Retro Church, you know that you got a ton of people, a ton of followers that are ready to go. So when you say, who will I send? You know that you've come to this place. So I got many people that will go on my behalf and share my good news. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.